let's uh, continue. Uh, we are actually done with uh, as much as I wanted to say about uh, quantization. It's a very interesting subject, but it's mostly electronics kind of stuff. Uh, what I'm going to do today is start talking about waveform encoding. Right? This is the simplest way of how we trans translate our sample and quantized signals into actually numbers, uh, ones and zeros. And the approach here is kind of straightforward. You have a sample, it's a number, and let's represent that number in a, in a, a binary system. Now you may say, well, how can it be more complicated? Well, it can be quite a bit more, more uh, sophisticated because these samples, if I have a knowledge that they're coming from a certain kind of signal, then I can use to my advantage and maybe not encode every number, maybe encode the difference between two numbers, maybe take hundreds of them and encode them all at the same time. And we do that in, uh, quite a bit in communication systems to gain some sort of efficiency. Usually efficiency that we're looking for is reduction in the overall number of bits that is required to represent a given signal. Uh, when we do what I'm going to go over today, and just uh, translating essentially the samples into numbers, we are, uh, we are relatively inefficient. We're doing one at a time, but it's a very simple way of doing it. And it kind of works for every signal. As long as you're within a given bandwidth, you're fine. Right, so uh, so these kind of systems are generally deployed, and, and towards the end of, uh, of uh, today's lecture, I'm going to review North American T1 uh, line, and I'm going to go over how how that line is structured, and uh, it's been put uh, in, in use uh, shortly after the uh, Second World War, and it's still in use today, and nobody's complaining about it. So it's one of those systems that, uh, that was uh, very, very successful. So uh, there are, so waveform quantum. So waveform coding is designed, is focused on the waveform, right? On the waveform. In other words, focused on the signal itself without paying too much attention to what that signal is. And it tries to encode this signal with a minimum distortion. So it encodes um, with the smallest possible distortion. Right? There are several different methods that um, we use here. I'm going to list some of them, some of basic methods how we can some. Um, first one is pulse coded modulation. And that's the one that uh, I'm going to mostly be talking about uh, uh, today. Then there is something called uh, differential pulse coding modulation or differential PCM. And there are a class of modulation techniques which are called delta modulation. So there's a, what is called delta modulation. and adaptive delta modulation. So this one symbol is delta M, and uh, I guess this one would be DPCM, and adaptive delta modulation. Delta modulation. All of these are actually used in practice PCM is the big guy on the block. It's used for the for uh, landline telephony. Also, it is used uh, uh, in some other system. Delta modulation turns out to be more robust 
uh, uh, than uh, uh, PCM, and it's used a lot in uh, systems that appreciate that, that are supposed to work in a low signal to noise ratios. Um, however, both of them are now, uh, I would say, considered dinosaurs, and most of the uh, contemporary systems, digital systems, use more sophisticated modulation schemes because of the advent of coding and, and uh, our ability to do that with these. But let me explain uh, these, uh, these two. Uh, I think pulse coding modulation and delta modulation. And uh, I'm going to just briefly mention what differential PCM and adaptive delta modulation are. So let's take a look at first PCM. PCM is what uh, you would think of a straightforward implementation of the sampling theorem. So here is where you're going to have your signal, x of t. Uh, we know that uh, before we let any signal go into a digital system, we usually uh, make sure that the bandwidth of that signal is limited to what the design bandwidth of the system is. And this is the reason for that is to make sure that our sampling theorem uh, that our sampling is adequate, right? So uh, the first thing here is this uh, low-pass filter that limits the bandwidth of what comes through this uh, system here. Then you have your sampler. And we know that uh, as a result of that, at least theoretically, you get uh, a sequence of samples. And then you have your quantizer. and you get your x hat of n, which are your quantized values. And then you have your encoder that uh, produces zeros and ones at the output here that you're going to send through channel. So this goes into channel. So that's your PCM, very straightforward. There's nothing uh, extraordinary here beyond what uh, you suspect that uh, should be there. Uh, we have two ways of uh, uh, quantizing here, as we discussed last time. You have uh, uh, two uh, types of quantizers. Uh, we have a uniform and then non-uniform. We saw that uh, in both of these cases, uh, the central piece is a uniform quantizer, and then your non-uniform quantizer it just means that before we, we present the signal to this whole process of sampling quantization, we have to, uh, pre, uh, we have to compress it with a, with a compressor that has usually, uh, that usually implements mu or a law, depending on which geographical region you're operating in. So let me quickly review the main results that we get, uh, that we derived uh, last time, so that we have them side by side. The principal result that we care about is really signal to quantization noise ratio, because here we understand that the uh, process of sampling and quantization is going to produce the samples that are going to be slightly different than the actual signal, right? And uh, the quantization, is irreversible process. The, the errors that are introduced through quantization are, are not recoverable. You, you know, once you round something to a nearest uh, quantization level, you cannot easily guess what the number was. Right? Sa sampling, you know, at least theoretically, is is reversible process. Right? If we can live with infinite delay. Right? But uh, quantization is not. Quantization is an engineering trade-off, where we trade off our signal to quantization noise ratio with the number of bits that we use to represent each individual sample. So let's take a look at first the uniform PCM. Uniform meaning that uh, we use a uniform quantizer. So, so here's what we have, range for input samples. Uh, 
uh, between minus u min and u min. Uh, the, if the range is symmetric, which is usually the range is symmetric, it would go from minus u0 to sub u0. Uh, the number of quantization levels, number of levels, is usually designated it is designated as a Q and it's usually given as a power of two. It doesn't have to be, right? But uh, since we are ultimately representing everything in a binary arithmetic with ones and zeros, then we we like to use all of our <coughs> possible levels. And if you're already dedicating let's say four bits, then you might as well use sixteen different levels because that's the, the finest quantization you can get with four bits. So quantization step. We use the uh, value delta is going to be 2 u0 over q minus 1. I guess if you have q different levels, then you have q minus 1 different intervals, which uh, I'm going to say is approximately 2 u0 over q, which is uh, 2 u0 over 2 to the n, which is u0 over 2 to the n minus 1. Because n is usually large and you can neglect this one, you know, relative to the, to the rest of it. <coughs> now, power of the quantization noise. So this is power of quantization noise. P noise quantization is going to be delta squared over 12. Now, there is a caveat that allowed us to say that, and this is that these delta intervals are relatively small. Right? For small intervals, this is true. And this is kind of universally accepted. Now, let me just point out, I mean, we're, we discovered this when it came to quantization, right? But uh, we do also we do quantization even when we don't have a quantizer. What I'm saying is this: a lot of times you're going to be actually doing all sorts of rounding, right? You know, you you take your uh, whatever is the calculations, and let's say you round to a third decimal place or four decimal place and so on. And the question is, what kind of uh, you're making certain error, right? So what is the behavior of the error? The behavior of the terror we is usually modeled as a random variable with a uniform distribution. Because if I'm rounding something, then I'm making you know if these are different uh, levels that uh, I'm rounding precision, then uh, everything that is within this interval is going to be rounded to this point. So your error is going to be between minus delta over two and delta over two and it's going to assume uniform character. So whenever you have a rounding, the behavior of the rounding error is usually modeled as a random uh, variable that has a uniform distribution. Where it comes a lot of times into play is in DSP, right? Because you always, because a lot of times you're working with finite arithmetic, right? You, you have a certain number of bits in your uh, arithmetical logical unit and then you're always rounding, and then you model that error that you get as a, as a, as a rounding error, and it has a uniform distribution within a, whatever is the LSB uh, uh, precision that you have in your process. Now, this uh, can be expressed slightly differently. So we have already the delta is u0 over 2 n minus 1. So I have u0 over 2 to the n minus 1 quantity squared divided by 12. And this gives me expression u0 squared over 3 times 2 to the 2n. Uh, I just need this for later, so I just calculate it. Usually you remember, you remember this, uh, this expression here. So that's the power of the quantization noise. 
Let's take a look at um, uh, signal to quantization noise ratio in the case of the uniform encoders. And so SQ and R in this case is going to be 10 log of expected value of your signal squared, which is the you know the second moment of your of your signal, divided by power of the quantization noise, which uh, let's just uh, do a little bit of substitution here. So this is 10 log of uh, expected value of x squared over u0 squared and then times 3 times 2 to the 2n. And then if we unwrap this little bit, so this becomes 10 log of expected value of x over u0 quantity squared. Uh, let me just use the square bracket here. And then plus 10 log of 2 to the 2n and plus 10 log of 3. Now, this thing here is uh, power of the signal power of the signal normalized to the range of the, of the uh, uh, quantizer and expressed in VB. This thing here is your 6 uh, N, right? <coughs> and then this thing here is 4.77 or 4.8. So 10, 10 log of 3 is 4.8 approximately. So that's a general expression of, for the signal to quantization noise ratio for the uniform quantizer. And uh, it has these kind of three components, one constant, and then this 6n here as a general behavior of the quantization process. This, this is always there. You know, you, if there's one thing you need to remember is this 6n factor that teaches you how much of an improvement you get every time you introduce additional bit in your quantization process. This thing here is uh, essentially where your uh, PDF of the, of the signal that you're trying to quantize comes into play. This is essentially expected value of your signal normalized to the range of the quantizer. So you want your signal to exercise as much of a range as possible for an optimal. Well, if your signal stays around zeros, zero, then this number becomes very, very small. Because x over u0 becomes small, you square it, and then expected value of that is even smaller. So then your signal to quantization noise ratio becomes low. So if you look at uh, good candidates for uh, just the uniform quantizer, are the signals that are, that are occupying this range between minus u0 and u0 and are frequently across all possible values across that range. If you have a signal that is, that is dwelling in, in one portion of that, of that range, and most notably, you know, signals tend to dwell around zero, that's where you start losing the efficiency of the whole process because you, you're having a quantizer that has a lot of quantization levels, but you're essentially, your signal is living in these, in these you know, a smaller range, so this is all wasted, right? And that's why we need to do a compression. Of. But this is a good, a good uh, uh, formula to have, to have handy. Now, uh, let's. We we did an example of uh, if you're. Uh, so let me just put that here. Example: If uh, x is uniform between the range of minus u zero and u zero then um, expected value of x over u0 squared is exactly one third. And uh, when you translate, so this is your, uh, so PSN becomes 10 log of 1 over 3, which is minus 4.8 dB. So for uh, signal that is uniform, going through a uniform quantizer, this and this will cancel, and you just get 6n. 
So a beautiful result there. Right? So if you have a signal that has is uniformly distributed, that you run through a uniform quantizer, then the signal to quantization noise is exactly six n. If the signal has some other kind of distribution, then this and this will not cancel, and, and you would have something that uh, that would be some sort of panel. You wrote DBM there. Yes, yeah, DBM. No, DB. DB. Uh, sorry, DB. These two classes are too close to one. <laughs> All right, so um, so that's a summary of um, uniform PCM. Let's, let's just go and summarize non-uniform PCM. What happens there? Here, I start very much the same range of input signal. Uh, minus u min to some u max. But usually, if the range is symmetric, it's from minus u0 to u0. And so, And then um, total number of quantization levels is Q to the N. But in this case, my quantization step is delta I depends on the actual magnitude of your input signal, right? And, and typically for us, you know, the way how we do it is for smaller x, the quantization step is smaller, and then as x grows, the quantization step becomes larger. But in general, it is given as approximately 2 times u0 over 2 to the n, and then f prime of x, where f of x is the function of a compressor of the compressor to make smaller steps uh, uh, for smaller x the step smaller this tells you that for around the origin where x is small uh, f prime the derivative of this function is large so it's very steep and then it kind of flattens towards the towards the end of the of the range. So in this case, power of the quantization noise uh, P and Q is equal to 1 over 12 uh, U0 over 2 to the n minus 1 squared, and then integral from, uh, I guess, minus u0 plus u0, pdf of x over f prime of x dx. That's the expression that we derived last time. And um, I guess I can rewrite this again as u0 squared over uh, 3, and then there's 4 here that helps this 2, so it's 2 to the 2n minus u0 plus u0 pdf of x divided by f prime of x dx. Now you can see that this is a generalization of this one here, because if you have a uniform signal that occupies the range from minus u0 to 0, if the signal is uniform and there is no, no compression, it is quantized by the uniform quantizer, then f of x is equal to x, right? And then its derivative is equal to 1, so this goes to 1. And then if this is a uniform distribution between minus u0 and u0, the area under the curve is equal to 1. So this for the uniform signal and no compression, 
this whole second interval integral becomes equal to one, and then this and this is identical, right? So this is kind of encompasses this as a special case. Right? So that's the power of the quantization noise. The, um, the derivative of x is not supposed to be squared. No, that's that is in that uh, expression for S Q and R. Right? Yeah, but we're getting um our delta is two V over for this square delta I of X and the function F X the function of delta I of X. You you mean here it's mm -hmm. supposed to be square? No, it's supposed to be squared in the equation. Somewhere it needs to be squared, right? Um I I, I what did, whatever we did last time, can you look it up? I it's think the you're square right. Square of the denominator. Just I think you're right. I think this needs to be squared. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right because remember we did the derivation last time. It needs to be squared, and, and I, I think it makes sense because this is delta squared, right? But uh, what I just said in terms of this being a sp uh, generalization of this still holds. Because if this is equal to f of x equal x, then this is one, and then one squared. Is so it's squared on the others, on that other expression. No, 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 no not here. Because remember, this is now signal to quantization noise ratio, so it's, it's the power, right? This is just a magnitude. So that's why it's squared here. You see here, u0 is squared too, here it's not. So that's why it's squared, thank you. I was looking at it and I was kind of didn't feel right. So correctly in the notes as well. So. So that's the power of the quantization noise. Now let's uh, look at S, Q, and R. So S, Q, and R here becomes uh, 10 log of uh, expected value of x squared divided by p and q, kind of big, uh, quantization noise. So this becomes 10 log. Uh, I can put this inside. So this becomes the expected value of x squared. But I'm going to bring this u0 squared inside right away. And then these two climb upstairs. So I have 3 times 2 to the n. And then also integral from minus u0 to plus u0, pdf of x divided by f prime of x quantity squared on the x. But this needs to be downstairs, right? So the whole thing to the minus 1. needs to be the same level as u0 squared. Okay, so let's uh, work on this one a little bit, simplify it, and hopefully it will, uh, it will gain a shape that is, that is similar to the other one. So we end up with a SQNR in this case equal to, uh, now this whole thing is again power of signal normalized to the range of the quantizer. So this is power of signal normalized in dB. And then <coughs> plus 6n and plus 4.8 and then minus 10 log of uh, integral from minus u0 to plus u0 pdf of x divided by f prime of x quantity squared d. Right? So you can see how we have essentially the same terms here. We have 6 n and 4.8 there and then power of the signal normalized and then there, this, is, this is the correction factor now that uh, is coming from the nonlinear quantization but by, from the fact that we are compressing the signal uh, when uh, 
when uh, we uh, we do non-uniform really quantization. Now, the the thing to remember again is this 6n. Right? This is present here as well. And your freedom now to deal with the fact that now you have this PDF that uh, is non-uniform and you have some way of connecting that. And, and this, is, this is what you have over here. And hopefully, you know, this will, you know, if this becomes too small because the signal is, uh, is yeah, uh, occupying only portion of the range, then you're actually working on this to become, to become uh, small as well, so that the, the small that this so that the whole thing is large as a term and improves your signal to quantization resolution. This is you usually don't have control over this, right? And you don't have control of anything in here but this f of x. And this is by changing the shape of f of x, you actually can improve your signal to quantization noise ratio. The way how we go about it, remember last time, is we define those mu uh, curves, and the mu has a single parameter that you can tweak and get all sorts of shapes for f of x. And then you know, uh, selection of the mu is actually done so that it maximizes this uh, uh, s q and r. Excuse me, Professor, before we are going too far, I, I have a question here. Mm -hmm. So, what is actually the main difference between non-uniform PCM and the uniform PCMs that, that we can see here? Uh, the only difference is existence of this f of x, right? Uh, uh, Quantization, or yeah, in in a, whether you have a compressor or not, oh. right? The the uniform looks like this, right? You have your uh, signal, you have your low pass filter, mm -hmm. then you have your sample. And then you have a quantize. And then it goes, you know, so. Non-uniform looks like this. You have your this guy, then you have your point piece block diagram, you have your compressor, and then you have sample and quantize. So this is uniform, and this is non-uniform. This is f of x, the only difference. If I were to make f of x equal to x, then you can see that this is a special case of this one. Right. And you can see that even by equations here. If I make f of x equal to x, then f prime of x is equal to 1. And then this is an area under the curve of the PDF, which is 1. So 10 log of 1 is 0. And then this becomes the same as this, right? Right. So that's, but that's a trivial case. That's not a very interesting case for us. The interesting case for us is when this is non uniform, therefore we are taking a penalty on your normalized signal. And what we're trying to do with this f prime of x is select in, in such a way to improve our signal to quantization ratio. Because if this is too small, then you're getting penalty of S Q and R. And then you are trying to pick your f of x so that you correct for that. Go ahead. But when the PDF of x over f prime of x is 1, this is going to be the smallest it can be is 0. And it's a subtraction. Oh, well, OK. PDF. Uh, is is always smaller than one, right? Correct. Right. Yeah, yeah. Not necessarily always smaller than one, but this tend on has tendency to be relatively small. So the whole integral here <coughs> tends to be less than one, right? So then log of all that becomes uh, becomes positive number. So this is usually positive number for any any practical use, right? You wouldn't want to use f of x such that this ends up being negative number because that means I'm using something that degrades my SQL. So this whole thing becomes smaller than one so that 10 log negative, negative and then improves. Right? Okay. Now that's uh, that's up to this point. What happens here? Well here you have these uh, discrete number of uh, levels that uh, you have them all numbered because they're discrete quantization levels, right, that are 
uh, usually there the are two to the end of them. So let's take a look at data rate. of uh, pass coding modulation. You, your R PCM is equal to whatever is the sampling rate. This is how many samples per second you have. I'm multiplying the number of bits per second. As simple as that. So if I'm sampling at 8, eight kilohertz, then, uh, and I have 8 bits per sample, then my total, total bit rate, or total uh, yeah, total bit rate is 64 kilobits per second. Now the question that we always you know, uh, love to know and, and always actually try to determine in, in communication is, well, what is the bandwidth that is required to send this data? Uh, you have a certain bit rate, means I produce this many ones and zeros per, per second. What, how much of a spectrum do I need to send it? And that's a, not an easy question to answer. We're going to look that into great detail a little bit later in, uh, in the course when we start looking into signaling over band-limited channels. I'm going to give you a rule of thumb here that, uh, that uh, we're going to use for until we get to the point where we can actually uh, use a mathematical expression to tell us exactly what the bandwidth is going to be. Excuse me, Professor, mm -hmm. but why we, we why do we need like to consider to know the spectrum? Well, because you cannot send ones and zeros, right? What do you send? Voltages and currents, right? Right. I cannot, Voltages and I cannot, you know, uh, you know, go on a line and send one. What is one? It's some voltage. True or false? Yeah. Like that? So some voltage or some current. Now, when it comes to signals going through physical media, you know what the signals consist of. What do signals consist of? Power. Put power your foot. No, put your foot. You say yeah. Put your glasses, right? Domain. What do signals consist of? Frequency. Or sinusoidal, right? So okay. So now, if I build my signal out of sinusoidals and I send it through a channel, channel is going. I want to make sure that the channel treats all the sinusoidals that are part of the signal with respect, right? Because if it starts deleting some of the sinusoidals, I might be sending this, and what comes out is completely different. Okay. Remember our, our linear system theory. If I, if I took, for example, this, if this is my pulse, this is what I'm going to send if, if we get one. If I put my Fourier glasses, what are the sinusoidals? So this is time. What are the sinusoidals that build this? How do they look like? There is infinitely like many, and like not only like that. Like yeah. Not only that. I need all of these sinusoidals, and I need infinitely many of them. So is this a good pass to signal with? No, because you need an infinite band to accommodate this. You know, otherwise, you know, you're going to send this, and what is going to come? as an output of channel, you know, if, if you're lucky, it might look like this, right? But if you're unlucky, it might actually look quite good, right? So what, we, what, so what is of a great importance to us is to relate these two quantities, the period, which is essentially linked to the number of bits that you have per second, and the bandwidth that it occupies on the line. And, uh, what we, what I'm going to tell you at this point is that the bandwidth is proportional to the bit rate, right? So at this point, we're going to say the bandwidth requires, so that we can use, do examples and, and problems, right? We're going to say if you, if you are uh, pushing, let's say, 100 kilobits per second, you need a line that is 100 kilohertz wide in the band, right, at this point. This is not a minimum theoretical one. The minimum theoretical is the one that he quotes in the book, which is a half of that. But you, for the reasons that we're going to discover later, that is pretty impractical, right? So more practical is that your bandwidth that you require is on the order of the 
data rate that you're trying to, uh, bit rate rather, that you're trying to push through the line. So if you need one megabit per second, you know, and you're signaling with just ones and zeros, then you need about one megahertz of the channel to accommodate that practice. That, that uh, you know, we all kind of know that practically, right? If you, if you try to signal over twisted pin, right, that uh, blue and, and white line, right. one of the first things that I think I put on, on this board that the bandwidth, all of these landline channels uh, uh, behave as a low-pass filter. They have certain cutoff frequency. Cutoff frequency of a twisted pair is on the order of 100 kilohertz. So that kind of limits the, the bandwidth that you can use, the, the bit rate that you can signal through the twisted pair. If you need, have a need for a larger bandwidth, then you need to go one step up, and this is your coaxial cable. Right? And coaxial cable has an order of magnitude higher cutoff frequency. So now you're not in 100 kilohertz, you're few few megahertz, right? And then if you, if you talk about... Uh, uh, waveguides and, and these kind of structures, then they go even higher, a right? few giga, gigahertz of, uh, of uh, cutoff frequency. So, so for our for for our analysis so far, we're gonna say bandwidth is uh, you know proportional to your bit rate, right? Well, as I said, this is kind of rough uh, rough uh, approximation right now. We're gonna go and and talk about that in, in great detail later in the course. So let's take a look at an example that we all know very well. So uh, for uh, voice, right, we have the bandwidth of the signal is 4 kilohertz. So in this case, sampling rate, which is two times the, uh, let me call it W, because I'm gonna, two times W, which is going to be two times four kilohertz, which is going to be eight kilohertz. So voice, we're going to sample with eight kilohertz. The rate, bit rate, is going to be fs times n. Voice is usually uh, quantized with 256 levels, which means that you have 8 bits per sample, which means 8 kilohertz times 8 bits. Uh, so this gives you 64 kilobits per second. This is what we call telephone voice. And uh, the bandwidth that you require, I'm going to say, is approximately 64 kilohertz to send this, send this over, over, let's say, some analog channel. Excuse me. Is that Nyquist approach, Professor? <coughs> yeah. Where do we use Where do we use Nyquist? We use it here. Right. Right. This is our Nyquist. Nyquist, right? Nyquist material. Nyquist, right? The, we, we talked about it in linear systems. You right. never really sample at Nyquist rate. So right. this is not really 4 kilohertz. You know. We telephone voice extend from 300 hertz to 3.4 kilohertz. That's what we consider telephone voice. You know. right. But, but we right. allow this 600, uh, 600 hertz at the very end of the signal so that we can design our filters. Right? We don't have to build brick filters. We can have a filters with a relatively graceful row of, but then nominally these filters end at 4 kilohertz and then we can use this for sample. Okay? Now, uh, what uh, is enabled and what is also kind of traveling hand in hand with PCM is something that's called time division multiple. Time division multiplexing is how we uh, allow multiple signals. Multiplexing in general is uh, a mechanism how we allow multiple uh, communications to share the same physical channel. Channels, you know, no matter what the channel is, it's some physical resource and it's a commodity that's relatively precious. 
So the cost of operation of your system usually depends on how efficient you are in utilizing your channel. Let me give you some examples. The, if you have a, if I go and uh, 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 travel to uh, bring the wire from this room to, let's say, my office, uh, and I operate only one uh, uh, communication, that's relatively expensive. But uh, if I share that and I connect everybody in this building to everybody on that building somehow, then I'm utilizing my resource eff efficiently. That's a relatively simple example, but it gets uh, more elaborate. Let's say you try to connect now US to Europe, you're gonna lay down the optical fiber, that's pretty expensive operation. You better be able to share that optical fiber with a lot of, a lot of communications. And it gets even more critical when it's a radio link because there's you know, optical fiber. If you need one, then you just put another one. But you cannot create additional additional spectrum if it doesn't exist there. <coughs> so, uh, time division multiplexing is one of the, um, I guess, fundamental ways how we can share the same channel. Let me uh, draw a, a diagram that will I will use to explain it. Uh, what enables time division multiplexing is the actual sampling theorem. What sampling theorem allowed us to do is instead of having continuous points for a given signal, I have points that are now discrete you know, versions of the signal. And there is all this time in between where the signal does not exist. Right? So I can use that to interlace it with other signals. So let me guys put here the principle of time division politics. So I imagine that I have um, n different users on a transmission side, and this is a transmitter one, transmitter two, and then transmitter n. And uh, this is your analog to PCM. In other words, what I do in this block, I take my signal, which is an analog signal, and what comes out of this block are ones and zeros that I'm sending towards my, my system here. And let's say for every one of the samples, I'm gonna get 8 bits or what I'm going to call a word, you know, word associated with a given set. So here is word 1 for the first guy, word 2 for the second guy, and so on. Word uh, 2 for 1 for the second guy, 2, 2, and so on. And word n, uh, first word for the end guy, and 2, and so on. So, Every one of these will, for every sample, it will produce uh, produce so called eight bit word that represents this particular sample. The the bit rate here is going to be R B zero, and for the sake of simplicity here, I'm going to assume that the same bit rate is produced by every one of these users. So if if, if this is voice then there is a stream here of 64 kilobits per second, 64 kilobits per second, 64 kilobits per second coming out of every one of these transmissions. Now the system kind of looks, you know, at least in schematic, something like this. Okay. You can think of this as a rotating, rotating switch. switch that connects this line, uh, each individual user to this particular line. So this is your, and then on the other end, you're gonna have something which works in the opposite direction. So let me do this. And uh, excuse me, Professor. Uh huh. I have a question here. Let me just finish this. Okay. PCM to analog. And then. And then this is the line. 
last one. And this is again R B zero, R B zero, R B zero. So this is now the reception for the first one, reception for the second one, reception for the nth one. And this switch now, if this one rotates this way, this one has to rotate this way. Right, connected. So for example, here this is now connected to this. And then when the word first word goes, then this switch connects here and then here, and then these two pairs are connected and so on. What you need to know that the line here, RB at the multiplex line, is equal to n times RB0. This line needs to be at least n times faster than each individual of these things. So if I have, let's say, 10 users, each one of them producing 64 kilobits per second, then this line needs to be 640 kilobits per second. Why? Because this line is shared. And if you, if you now look at the time, let's say this is one second from here to here, then only portion is dedicated to the user one, right? So you, you need to be able to send this entire word that comes, let's say, every second or whatever comes here in a second, you have to send it over a portion of the second. How, how small is this portion? Well, if it is shared by n user, one so it's one nth of the second. So this needs to be at least n times faster than whatever is the data in here. Go ahead. Yes. Actually, what is the purpose we understand this one? Principle of time division multiplexing. What is the purpose of time division multiplexing? It's to allow multiple transmissions over the single line. Right. We have need the need for that all the time. If, I, if I'm taking an optical fiber between, let's say, Orlando and, and, and Atlanta, I want to use it by many, many users. And one, the, one of the most efficient ways how we do that is we multiplex them in time. So if you look at now how this, let's, let's, let me try to, to, to draw this. Let's say this guy is X, and this guy is like this, and this guy is like this, right? So if you were to look at the stream here, you know, and let's assume you have three users, so here's the first one, second one, third one. Then again, first one, second one, third one, and so on, right? So they're all coming through the same line. Yes, I could understand because it divides by, by the time. Yeah. And actually my point is, what is the relation between the PCM and Time efficient, actually. I, I can see that you have a. Oh, the, 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 they're, they're kind of go hand in hand, you know. They, they don't, they're two different things, right? The, the one is PCM is just a simple digitalization of the, of the, of the waveform, right? To sample, quantize, produce ones and zeros. Right. So you don't really have to have TDM. But the biggest, uh, uh, you know, application of PCM is in digital telephony. And also, the biggest application of the uh, uh, time division Point. multiplexing is in the landline, you know, data transfer, landline telephony, and data as well. And uh, what we have is these guys go hand in hand. So these streams of ones and zeros are multiplex on these streams ones and zeros. And then it is not uncommon, actually, it's 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 uh, almost all the time that you actually have multiple levels of this multiplexing. Multiplexing. So you, you may have a certain number of users here, user group of n of them, and then another group of n of them, and each one of them is multiplexed on the line, like this. And then these two lines are multiplexed on, on some higher hierarchy, and then you know you kind of build the hierarchy so that you can have one cable carrying thousands of conversations, right, between two switches, and then at every switch it's parsed out and sent its, its own way. Go ahead. Um, do does that have to be in the same or order, like one, two, three, or can it can the order shift? Can user one send his for uh, the first slot, then user n send the second slot? Uh, what if some users uh, doesn't send anything? Uh, the if the user doesn't send anything in this model here, the slot goes empty. 
It's wasted. It's wasted, right? It's it's wasted. So so that's where where. Uh, so that's where you know uh, for voice this is okay, but uh, you know in, in data what we do is we do extensive buffering on both ends, and we 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 have uh, uh, it, it kind of opens the whole sorts of questions right because this is assuming this is very simple that's why it's very attractive you know you have something that is that is a, a train here that uh, that kind of goes all the time, right? It doesn't wait to be full, right? Uh, and it's efficient if you have enough traffic to justify that. But uh, if you don't, then you have to have uh, something that goes only when it's full. And uh, uh, for, that, uh, for that, you have to have addressing and all the kind of stuff that introduces overhead, but it's ultimately more efficient. But what, what it turns out, you know, even though I said, uh, when you start talking about systems that are carrying large volumes of data, like internet, uh, there's always something to send, right? And you start aggregating, and, and you always have buffers full, and then this train always goes, right? So you might as well use the T1 multiplexing. And a lot of times, at the physical layer, what you have is, is the same you know, kind of structure that we use for landline voice. All right, so let me actually uh, walk through a, an example of this system. This is uh, something you guys uh, might have heard, but let's uh, look at the practical application of this. Is it the slots based on the FS, the number of FS? What's that frequency? Sampling frequency? Yeah, the let me let me actually go through an example so okay. you can see. It, may, it can have, it can be different, right? This is a, a this, this time this is a general principle. For for all we can, you know, we can even assume that this is a GSM when you're multiplexing your users on a on a on a single frame, right? Right. But let me talk about landline telephony. So landline telephony. It implements PCM with time division multiplexing. There are two systems in the world. There is what is called T1 hierarchy, or, and then E1. Or sometimes you can hear people calling this American and calling this European. European system. They're virtually the same. And uh, they're so similar that if you buy equipment, usually equipment would come with T1 and E1 portals. So you, whichever one you connect, it works, right? What is that, T1 and E1 port? Yeah. You like port? Port, port, like port. You RS, RG45, RG11? I don't know what the, or it, it says <laughs> T1 and E1, right? So <laughs> you have two holes and then you pick the appropriate one. Right? Yeah, like that. Uh, so, uh, since we're uh, in the U.S., let me go and talk about T1 hierarchy. So, kind of explain how this this whole principle is implemented in T1. In T1, you have 24 users, so 24 uh, PCM channels that are multiplexed on a single line. Uh, each one of these channels, one of them is referred to as DS0, right? So you have 24 DS0s that are multiplex on a single T1 line. Uh, one multiplex of these 24 channels, so one period or one multiplex of 24 channels. Is referred to as frame, and we a lot of times when it comes, this is a uh, this is a terminology for TD time division multiplexing. We talk about slots. Slot is each one of these guys, and then one repetition of all slots for all users is usually referred to as a frame. And then you know we we have super frames, hyper frames, and all of that, which is a higher level of organizations. 
So structure of the TDM frame. So here's how the TDM frame looks like. There is a first bit here that is one bit that is called frame, framing bit. And this bit in TDM T1, let me just actually read this. So this is your uh, word 1-1, one, one, word 2-1, word 3-1, and the last is word 24-1, right? So these are your 24 ds zeros. And then there is one bit extra. And this bit here is toggle. It is 10101010. One, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Why is that important? Direction. Say again? Direction? Direction. Direction. Well, if, you, if I'm listening, the way for me to detect the beginning of the frame, I'm going to look for a bit, for a position oh, where the bit goes 10101010, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, right? Oh, if I I know that uh, I know I can calculate the number of bits here, right? There is 24, 24 times 8 plus 1. So whatever that is. One eight, plus uh, one. How much is this? 8 one, times 160, 192, 192, 193. So I look at a sequence of 193 bits, and I know I've captured the whole frame at the receiver, but I don't know where the beginning is. So I store a few of these, and then I look at at which position there is a bit that toggles one zero one zero one zero, right? And if I listen to that for long enough, which in this in this world maybe like a few seconds, you are actually you gain a synchronization. You detect a place where there is a bit that goes every time goes one zero one zero. So that's the beginning of the frame. Once you know the beginning of the frame because of the structure of this whole thing which is very fixed, right? You're actually synchronized to the whole thing. So this F bit here is the synchronization bit that allows you to detect the beginning of the frame. Go ahead. So, but normally in a frame, at the beginning it has an address bit, right? Which is three. No, three not bit. here, not here, right? That's, that's, that's what I was talking earlier, because this is a train that always goes. No need to address. Just tell me where the beginning of the train is. But when it is tra being transmitted from a transmitter to receiver, uh, after the free, we have address bit, a closing bit, and then the packet. Not here, because there is nothing to address. It goes okay. from point A to point B with a fixed load. You know, at the addressing you're talking about, if I send a packet from here to Australia, right, that packet calls the address. But it is moves down the protocol stack. It's it's kind of packaged all the way to these, and this connects. This is at the lowest level, connecting point A to point B. I'm gonna take my packet, put it on the train. There's hopefully gonna be somebody here who's gonna assemble the packet and say, okay, look at this. It goes to Australia. So not this train. Go this train, right? And then it's gonna route. This is your router, right? But this is at the physical layer, right? This is way down low, and it's just actually transfer layer, it's just transporting the bits. So this works at the physical layer of the OS7 OS M one? Yeah, yeah, at a very much much lower now. Isn't the the sync has to be bigger than one bit, doesn't it? It's like eight yeah. bits? Because if it's one, how does it know if it's different than the bit from the word one one? Exactly. Uh, well here's here's exactly if you look at just hundred one ninety three bits, you might be confused. Right? But if you look at let's say several of these frames. You know, it doesn't know. If I look at just one frame, any one is, any bit is one or zero. But then I look at next frame, and then let's say 50% of the bits didn't change. So all of a sudden, this 50% got a limit, frame, right? Then I look at the next frame, and 50% of those 50% didn't change, right? So if I Wait. listen to a few frames, then there's going to be, you know, one, and I keep on listening until there is only a single winner, right? Mm -hmm. And the winner winning is relatively fast because every time I'm going to cut in half. So you're going to pretty fast. And th this is not too long. We'll, we'll later detect how, actually, I, I, I can tell you how long it is. So the duration of this frame uh, is going to be, how do I determine that? Well, 
This is a work. Every how often do I have a work? Work. How often do I sample? Every one, uh, every sampling interval. There is one of these coming. So if I look at from here to here, that's that's one sampling interval, right? Right between two adjacent samples. How far are the samples apart? One over eight kilometers, right? So the duration of this frame is one over. So it's 0 0.125 millisecond, right? So in a, in a second, there is 8,000 of these frames running by. You know, so in a second, I'm sure I'm going to acquire synchronization. And second in our world is just a second, right? <laughs> Not, nothing. So I'm going to synchronize very fast relative to us, right? Okay, so that's that's the the, the, the that's the what we call uh, th that's the composition of the frame. There are two types of frames. Two types of frames. There is uh, one type that's called rocked and non-rocked. So there is a rocked frame, rocked and non-rocked. You know, what, what, what something is stolen from the first one, so that's why it's rob rob. Right. There's a robbery here happening. How does the rob frame look like? Well, all of them have very much the same structure, right? There's a 24 uh, channels, B and zeros. But the rob frame has these eight bits that are traveling in this time slot are 7 plus 1, where 7 is used for your voice, and one of them is used for signals, right? So every time there is a rock frame, there's one bit there that is not, uh, not used by your voice. Well, you know that sample has 8 bits, so what happened to the LSB? Gone. It's ignored, right? It's thrown away, right? And that bit is stolen and given to signal. Now, non rob frames look like this, right? As we this kind of started with. You have your frame bit and then 8 bit for voice, 8 bit for voice, and so on. If you look at uh, what is called a super frame, the super frame consists of 12 consecutive frames. So, super frame equal to 12 frames. And if you look at now 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So, 11, uh, 10, 12 consecutive frames are going to form a super frame. We already said the duration of the frame is uh, 125, 0.125 milliseconds. So the duration of this one is 12 times that. And if you look at uh, this first one is non rob frames 5 and 11 are rob frames. So this guy is rob frame and this guy is rob frame. So every sixth frame is a rob frame. So this is non rob no wrong, no wrong, no wrong. And then there is a right brain, no wrong, no wrong, no wrong, no wrong. Okay. So that's what you have uh, in terms of uh, frame. So this is accommodating everything, you know, your voice and your signal. Why do we need signal? Because there is some negotiation that always happens between the two endpoints, right? And uh, let's just calculate some of the data rates that we have here. So what is the total rate on a T1 line? Well, you we can say that this is 1 over duration of the bit. Okay? 
and uh, what is the duration of the bit? Well, I have the duration of the frame of, let's say, TF divided by the number of bits per frame. Duration of the frame is 0 0.125 milliseconds, and I have 193 bits per every frame. So, uh, and I need to take the inverse of that, right? No, no, no. sorry. One over this, right? One over TB. So it's one over TF over number of bits. So inverse of this. And this ends up being 1.544 megabits per second. And you've all heard that number when they talk about T, T1 line, that's a 1.5 megabit per second line. So the maximum data rate throughput that you can get through T line is 1.5. What is the throughput you get through E line? Uh, one, through 1.48, 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. right? 248 megabits. 2.048. Okay. Now, what is uh, the throughput you get per, per each individual channel, or I should say R V S zero. Well you get ten out of twelve frames that gives you eight bits every point one to five milliseconds. And then you get two out of twelve that give you seven bits in uh, zero point one to five millisecond. When you calculate this, you get 62.7 kilobits per second. So that's the actual data rate given to voice. It's not 64 kilobits per second, it's 62.7 kilobits per second that goes to each individual voice. One that bit every six frame is stolen and that, uh, that is not really your voice. Now if you look at your signaling, you get uh, every 24 frames, you get two bits. Let me just uh, understand this formula. 12 times 0 0.125 milliseconds. So let's see, how is this one? Uh, Help me here, how, how is this working? So duration, 12 bits, 12 uh, times, this is your duration of a super frame. And in a super frame, how many? Okay, in a super frame, I get two robbed frames. And every robbed frame gives me 24 bits, right? So there are two robbed frames, each one of them giving me 24 bits, and I have duration of a super frame downstairs. So this gives me a signaling throughput of 32 kilobits per second that I can use for signaling between two points connected to the T1 line. And what is the data rate for synchronization? Well, I have one bit every 0.125 milliseconds, so this is 8 kilobits per second that I dedicate to synchronization. So a relatively small synchronization overhead, which is, which is okay, because uh, these are landlines, so you don't have, uh, you know, you can synchronize your clocks relatively. Okay? Any questions here? Uh -huh. So when you buy a landline, do you get a dedicated DS0? When you buy a landline, uh, no, uh, you get this, you get your, you get part of it is dedicated, right? There's your telephone, let me draw it, right? <laughs> there is that uh, blue and uh, um, twisted pair, right? That connects you to what is called point of presence. Right? So you may have 
that, that's that box in your neighborhood <coughs> that all of phones in a given neighborhood are connected. And then from point of presence, that's where you start sharing lines. So this part is dedicated. This part is dedicated. But it's not a D S zero, right? No, DS0. this is analog line. This yeah. is analog line. This actually here's where you're connected to sampling, quantization, all of that stuff. The PCM right. stuff there. Yeah, it starts from here. All right, this is PCM. Here it's analog. I'm going to extend this question actually. Uh -huh. Just one one second. I mean like in some of development countries, like part of <coughs> Asia, uh, I mean in Asia. Somebody can like store something <coughs> from the telephone landline. So how does it Yeah, <laughs> say somebody can like steal can something, right? Right. That's right. a very, it's very uh, ambiguous statement. Right? What are they stealing? Copper? <laughs> no, it's a lot line before the POP, I think. That's what do you mean? You can connect here? Tapping. Tapping. Well, tapping. Yeah. Yeah. tapping, yeah. Tapping. Yeah, make them pay the bills. The the what you they can even be more inventive. You can actually go to a public, a public uh, booth and actually steal that one, because that one you're kind of stealing directly from the phone company. You don't have to put the coin. The coin. Bring your telephone. <laughs> but it's easier to like shake the booth <laughs> and the. Good there, there's a lot of lot of things. This, that's I mean, uh, uh, but this is how it works, right? So if you can cut in here. Then uh, this this system does not have much supervision. There is no, you know, like encryption. There is no challenging, right? Nothing of that. There right? will be a bug again, right? Yeah, that's like we have in wireless, right? So this system is much easier to tap than than wireless. You just have to know where. Right? So so at the pop, do they have a dedicated DS zero for every line they have coming in? No, no. This is this is your neighborhood. This is where where design is. You know, if you if you want to. Assume that all the telephones in the neighborhood can be dialed at the same time, then you have to have a dedicated DS0. But that's not the case. You have a fan out here, you do some engineering, and you say, I can connect 150 <coughs> households on a single T1 line. Because, yeah, because really, you know, how realistic is that all of us are going to make a phone call simultaneously? Not very. Right? So you do some traffic engineering and you dimension these lines properly. In this class, I, I don't teach that. In the PCS class, we teach how you do it. You know, per, you know, per line B and all of that stuff. Yeah. There's a way how you design it. So then, and, and then every now and then, you know, you, know, you, you pick up the phone and it's busy, right? And you kind of tap it and then somebody's, you know, terminates their phone and you get the line. Now, uh, what was I uh, saying? In, in a E1 hierarchy is very similar to this one. The differences are subtle. There is uh, 32 channels in a, in a, so that brings the data rate to 2048 uh, kilobits per second, 2.048 megabits per second. It multiplexes not 24, it multiplexes 30 users. There is no raw versus unrolled frames. There are two separate channels. So there's 32 users, actually uh, 32 channels that are present, but only 30 are used for voice, and two of them are used for, for just nothing but signal. So you have a 64, you have a twice uh, the channel, so 128 uh, kilobits per second <coughs> for signaling, and then you have 30 users each getting 64 kilobits per second. Of, of the data. Another point I wanted to make, uh, if, I, if I don't use this 8-bit, right, then my throughput is essentially 7 bits over uh, every 0 0.125 milliseconds. This turns out to be 56 kilobits per second. So that's your modem speed. Modem. No, no. Dial-up. Dial -up. Dial-up modem uses first seven bits, don't, doesn't use the eight bit, and, and that's why you're getting 56 kilobits per second. But it's not really 56, right? Well, it is 56 at the at the line, line right? right? How much is eaten up by packets and all you know overhead addressing and all of that? That's uh, that's now IT uh, IP stuff, TCP IP stuff. But at the at the physical line, 
that connects you to to you know from here to whatever LP, right? is is uh, 56 kilobits per second. That's your dial. Any other questions? What is our first exam? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, I don't know. I, I yeah. owe you two things and I still haven't provided you, right? Yeah. The homework. That's okay. Don't provide it. Is, uh, 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 Midterms. Exactly. All right, that's it for tonight.